Good morning. Good to see everyone this morning. I went, I went to push the button on the iPad there, and I realized that the video was in slow-mo. So Randy was going to preach for like four hours this morning. So <laughs> Let's stand and worship together. the song of the redeemed rising from the African plain it's the song of the forgiven drowning out the Amazon rain the song Praises that go from the top. 
Amen. Thank you. You can be seated for a moment. What a great truth. What a great promise. The Lord, our God, reigns. The Lord, our God, the Lord, our Savior, who has a name. This song is just simply titled, Jesus, You Reign.
Father, we're so thankful that you are a God who reigns. There is no one on the throne but you. When we try to rule ourselves, we mess it up. We try to rule other people, we mess that up as well. And when we refuse to let you reign over us or rule over us, or we think that we could do the, run the world better than you can, we're grasping at straws. We're chasing after the wind. We're feeble. We're flawed, we're weak, we're uninformed, we're misinformed, we're disinformed. But not you. It's not just that you know everything, and it's not just that you have all power, it's that you do all things well. And you direct us where to go and where not to go. How to respond or not to respond. When to rest and when to rise when to move forward or when to sit still. You are doing it because of all the things you know, because all the character you have, all the grace and all the compassion, all the mercy, all the wisdom, all the holiness and righteousness, all the things you've called us to that we're just not very good at. So we trust in you, the God who reigns and the God who rules and the God who does all things well. Thank you for being exactly who you are. And we rest in the confidence that you can never change. And that gives us a peace. So direct us and guide us and comfort us and soothe us to rest in you, the ruler and the creator of all things. In the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and continue to worship as our prayed. It's, we can make that statement, Jesus, you reign. But do we really mean it? This song just reminds us to allow him to reign in us.
hands held high Such small sacrifice I join with my life I sing in vain tonight May the words I say our prayer. Thank you. You can be seated. Our kids will head on back to children's worship. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, got some folks visiting with us today. We're glad to see you and I uh, want you to be at home with us today. Have a good time. Thank you for being present with us to worship the Lord. We got a lot of people out of pocket today traveling on the road, so be praying for our people as they make their journey to different places. I would encourage you to pray for Mark and Ann Custolo. They are on the road making their way to Cherry Point, North Carolina, where Micah is in the Marines. Uh, they're going to be getting there sometime. I don't think they made it last night. I think they're going to get there sometime today. But then 
Mark has to travel tomorrow to Northern Virginia. You know, he's Mattapani Native American. And uh, one of his cousins passed away, and he's going to be doing a funeral up there tomorrow after having driven all the way from Oklahoma. So he's, he's got a big task ahead of him. Pray for him. Also, Miss Betty Smith, we sent her off last week. Well, they didn't get off. She had to go to a hospital yesterday and had to deal with a kidney stone, and they've medicated her, and I think they're making their journey down to the Carolinas today. Be, be praying for her. I would also encourage you to pray for the Hearst family. They've got Samuel Shepherd here today for the very first time. And uh, hi, Sarah. Yeah, yeah. Let me pray just for a moment. Father, we're grateful for your goodness to us. We thank you that we can come together at times like today to celebrate you. What you did at the cross and through that tomb event, even the resurrection and the ascension back into heaven was all an expression of your love for us. We're undone people. To be honest, we're just sinners. We need you more than we need anything else. I pray today for those who already know you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving their soul. And Lord, I would pray for anyone here today who doesn't know you personally as Lord and Savior. God, please save their soul. That's what this is all about today. It's not just about a piece of bread and some juice. It's about the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, I was watching TV the other night. You saw me. <laughs> and they were talking about how Alexander the Great was the most impactful person ever to live. I beg to differ. There's been nobody like Jesus. Never has been, never will be. Thank you for what you've done for us. Help us to celebrate you today and give you praise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. No sermon notes today, so you're going to have to use your Bible or your phone. <laughs> Whichever you have, I hope you have something with Scripture. I want you to look at what Luke writes in the 22nd chapter of his gospel, beginning in verse 1. Luke 22, verse 1. I'll give you just a second to get there. Very interesting passage of Scripture, one that we've read a few times uh, as we observed the Lord's Supper. Uh, certainly want to bring it to your attention today. Luke 22, verse 1. Luke writes, The festival of unleavened bread, which begins with the Passover celebration, was drawing near. The leading priests and the teachers of religious law were actively plotting Jesus' murder. Imagine that. But they wanted to kill him without starting a riot, and possi uh, a, a possibility they greatly feared. Verse 3, it says, Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot. We all know that Judas was one of the twelve, though not a believer. Uh, he was a part of the twelve that Jesus had called. In this moment, Satan entered him. Literally, Satan, not a demon, but Satan possessed Judas Iscariot. He was one of the twelve disciples, and he went over to the leading priest, the captain, and the, the captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted that he was ready to help them. That, that tells me that there may have already been some conversation here. They were delighted that he was now ready to help them, and they promised him a reward. So he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so that they could arrest him quietly when the crowds weren't around. Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lambs were sacrificed. This was going to be a very busy and bloody week. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said to them, Go and prepare the Passover meal so that we can eat it together. And they asked him, Where do you want us to go? And he replied, As soon as you enter Jerusalem... You're going to see a man carrying a pitcher of water, and he will, he will meet you. 
Now that's a, a strong clue because men in that day didn't carry water. That was a woman's job. So this was a very unusual thing. He says to them, follow him at the house he enters. Say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is the place. So go ahead and prepare our supper there. The Bible says they went off to the city and they found everything just as Jesus had said. And they prepared the Passover supper there. In verse 14 it says, Then at the proper time, in God's perfect timing, Jesus and the twelve apostles, they sat down together at the table. We're going to talk about the word table there in just a minute. On this very special night, this preset time of God's prearranged plan to be carried out had finally come. The time had come for the passion of the Christ. This was his moment. This was his event. This was what Jesus literally came to earth to accomplish. The suffering and the death of Jesus was clearly linked to the Passover meal because he was to be and in fact was the ultimate fulfillment of the Passover because of his shed blood. Think about this. So many who put their faith in him would be spared the eternal death of sin. The consequence of sin, if left unchecked, and if you die with sin on your soul, the, the end result of that is eternal separation from God. That means no heaven, but a place called hell. Somebody told me the other day, preacher, we don't preach about hell enough. Probably don't. Hell's not a place you want to go. Heaven's a place where you want to go. Amen? Jesus Christ was God's perfect Passover lamb that was sacrificed for us so that our sins could be forever forgiven. Forever forgiven. As Jesus sat down that night with his disciples, he informed them that this would be their last Passover meal that they would enjoy together until later when he would return and reign as their king in the coming of his millennial kingdom. Jesus actually said it this way. I look forward, I have looked forward to this hour with deep longing, anxious to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat it again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What's the message behind what we're doing today? Well, the message and the context of the Passover was simply that God delivers us from the judgment of our sins by the death of an innocent substitute, somebody taking your place. All of the Old Testament sacrifices, and again, you got to think about this, literally, on the Passover, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lambs were, were killed every year. Uh, and they were merely symbols of a coming reality. Well, Jesus was that reality. You know, all, uh, you know, his death was and is sufficient to save every last soul that has ever lived in the past, living in the present, or living in the future. It's enough for you, it's enough for me. Aren't you glad? That one sacrifice is enough to save all of us. No animal sacrifice was ever in itself sufficient to do that job. No person has ever been delivered from divine judgment by the death of an animal. The writer of Hebrews tells us that. In chapter 10, verse 1, it says, The old system of the law of Moses was only a shadow of the things to come not the reality of the good things Christ has done for us. The sacrifices under the old system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never, never able to provide perfect cleansing, complete cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared but just the opposite happened he writes 
Those yearly sacrifices only reminded them of their sins year after year, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That is why Christ, when he came into this world, said, You did not want animal sacrifices or grain offerings, but you have given me a body. He's talking to God here, the Father. You have given me a body so that I may obey you. No, you were not pleased with animals that were burned on the altar or with offerings for sin. Then I said, this is Jesus' word, Look, I, O God, have come to do your will, just as it is written about me in the Scriptures. That night Jesus knew that he would be the long-awaited sacrifice sent by God to make the ultimate and the complete atonement for sin. And while that was taking place, thousands of countless, you know, of animals, lambs, would be uh, again sacrificed during the Passover season. When you think about all of those animals, you got to ask the question, you know, why? What what a meaningless waste for all of them to die when they did not accomplish what needed to be done, friends. That's why God offered His sacrifice. Think about this with me. God poured out his wrath against sinners just like you and me. But he did it on an innocent substitute on Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I want you to listen and be reminded again of what John the Baptist said about Jesus. In John chapter 1 verse 29, John writes uh, about John being down by the Jordan River baptizing people. And he says that John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said to his disciples, Look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one that I was talking about when I said, Soon a man is coming who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before I did. Now that's interesting because if you remember, John was his cousin and he was born six months ahead of Jesus. But he recognized who he was at this point said in verse 31, I didn't know that he was the one. They grew up together. They played together. They got dirty in the ditch together. You know, they swam together. They did all the things that kids did together. But John didn't know it was him until this moment. He said, I didn't know it was him, but I have been baptizing with water in order to point him out to Israel. And then John went on to say, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know that he was the one. But when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, when you see the Holy Spirit descending and resting upon someone, he is the one that you're looking for. He is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. In verse 34, John said, I saw this happen to Jesus. And so I testify that he is the Son of God. John saw that event, and he testified about it. Paul wrote, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Jesus was God's perfect and complete sacrifice for our sins, making this last Passover meal um, approved, the, the last Passover meal approved by God. So the symbolic sacrifice of of animals pointing to the true sacrifice would from that day forward no longer be necessary once the Savior was offered up on a cross. That evening, Jesus began by gathering with his small group of disciples, his faithful followers in this large, uh, dimly lit but modestly furnished upper room. You know, when we gather, we want a really nice place, right? Um the room they met in that night was not a lavish banquet hall. It, it, it wasn't a really nice conference room. The accommodations would have been very simple at best. This was a guest room. There were no elaborate furnishings in this room. And, again, probably not a table because it was not their custom to sit at a table to eat like we do. Didn't have chairs and a table. They would be seated on the floor on pillows. And so the scene that night would probably have resembled 
uh, maybe a, a, a gathering of friends around a campfire. They were gathering up to have a meal together. In this unlikely setting, Jesus introduced that night a practice to those men that has traveled down to us through all of the generations. And we, we look at this, we know what this is, we call this the Lord's Supper. Somebody referred to it this morning as communion. At this table, we are all invited into intimate fellowship with the Lord himself. What a beautiful thought. We're also invited to have fellowship with each other. For those of us who are part of the body of Christ, we're here this morning to partake in the Lord's Supper so that we can remember and celebrate and proclaim all that his death and burial and resurrection accomplished on our behalf. But today, I want us to think about this and, and understand that the practice and even the participation uh, of this Lord's Supper, is, it should really not be our focus. Think deep with me. Instead of that, our focus should be on what this sacrifice represents, what this sacrifice that we portray through the Lord's Supper represents. This is all about Jesus, right? It's all about what he did for us on the cross. It's all about the good news. And we hear that term a lot, good news, the good news of the gospel. That's what this is about. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the glory of God. It's about the Lord. It's been said that this practice is an anchor to ensure that we never drift too far from the glorious gospel. We are here as a church to present the gospel to the world. That's the good news of what Jesus did. This is all about him. It's all about what he did for us on the cross. You know, the gospel speaks about Jesus and his ordinary but absolutely unique birth. There's never been anybody born like Jesus, right? Uh, there's been a lot of different things happen in our world, but nobody ever come into this world the way Jesus did. It also is about his one-of-a-kind sinless life. Anybody here not sin? Nobody, right? No takers for that. Well, Jesus could say at the end of his life, I have never committed one sin. What a life lived. And remember, yes, he was all God, but he was all man too. He was all man. He never sinned one time. It also speaks about his submissive obedience to the Father. We talked about this last week. He said, you know, if there's any way that this cup of suffering can be removed from me, please do that. But not my will, but your will be done, Lord. It also speaks about his steadfast focus. You read in Scripture when Jesus left the Mount of Transfiguration, it said he set his face toward Jerusalem and he walked in that direction. He was looking for the cross. That was his mission. It speaks about his selfless service. He didn't come to be served. He came to serve us, us, you and me. All of us needed somebody to help us. It speaks about his sacrificial death, his glorious resurrection, and his amazing ascension. And oh yes, it speaks about his awesome promise to return. Did you get up this morning thinking today might be the day? You should have, because it could still happen today. We don't know, but his return could come at any time. No man has ever done what Jesus has done for you. Nobody. Friends, think about this. Jesus shed his blood, his innocent blood. He gave his life to save your lost soul. Are you glad? I am. Nobody could do that for you but Jesus. He is the perfect lamb of God. Jesus also came to give you life, abundant life, both now and and forever he said i came to give life life in all its fullness in its abundance and that abundant life certainly gives us peace in our hearts as we live in this very dark and evil world and you know some people love the world but this is a troubled world that we live in he also died to give us uh, he came to live and and die so that we could have hope beyond this life where we now live praise god jesus came to love us with a cross the cross you know this morning before we participate in the lord's supper i want to make sure that we're spiritually prepared to do that i'm going to ask ronnie and his team to make their way up to the stage in just a moment we're going to have you bow for a, a moment of silence and prayer 
Um, I want you to reflect on where you are and where you stand with the Lord. Uh, it's very important based off what Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Paul wrote, so if anyone eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily, that person is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. And that is why you should examine yourself before you eat the bread and drink from the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup unworthily, not honoring the body of Christ, then you are, uh, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. He says very clearly in verse 30, that is why many of you are weak, many of you are sick, and yes, some of you have even died. So I'd like for you just to bow your heads for just a minute, listen to uh, these short instructions and ponder where you stand with the Lord. I, I want you to bow your head, close your eyes, take a moment of being in posture for prayer, and uh, I want you to look within yourself for any unconfessed sin that there might be that would hinder the moving of God's Spirit here today. And I want to ask you to ask God to forgive that sin. I want you to look within yourself for anything that is causing disunity or division, whether that's in your home or at work or certainly here at church. I ask you to look for any form of prejudice that you might have in your heart, whether it is racial or social or economic or whatever it might be, any form of prejudice. Be, be honest. Be serious. Take a minute as you hear this song played and pray. And here's why you need to do that. It is simply because how you relate to each other, whether that is at home, in your family, whether that is here in the body of Christ, how you relate to each other affects how God relates to you. And it affects how God relates to us as a church. So this morning, I want you to pause and, and pray. Pray confessing your sin to God. Pray repenting of your sin. Pray apologizing to God. There may be somebody here you need to get up to and get up and go to and, and apologize for something you said or done. Be right in your heart with the Lord and with your fellow man before you partake of the Lord's Supper. So let's pause and ponder and pray. Lord, I thank you for what you've already Place a longing, a hunger for holiness, place an aching for uncomfortable faith. Come and move me, 
Lord, I give you my whole. Come undo who me. Earn a passion for souls. Cause Lord, I'm desperate for you. Longing for your move. I'm crying out for I'm going to ask our men to come join with me down front as we prepare to serve our fellowship, the Lord's Supper. The Bible said one night Jesus took some bread, some unleavened bread, flat cake, nothing, not like a biscuit, didn't have any leaven in it, it was just a flat piece of bread. And he broke it and he gave thanks for it, he broke it into pieces so that he could give it to his disciples, and he said to them, this is my body given to you, do this. Eat this in remembrance of me. The bread that Jesus broke and then gave to his disciples originally represented the event of the Exodus when the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt. But from that night forward, it has come to represent the physical body of Jesus Christ. This bread does not turn into the body. It represents the body. It is a symbol of the body of Christ. As we share this bread today, we do so remembering and celebrating his humanness, his incarnation, and his death as the only acceptable human sacrifice for the salvation of mankind. It's very interesting that that night he broke the bread, but in context, not one bone of his body was broken when he hung on the cross. He willingly gave his life and was already dead when they came to break his legs. They broke the legs of the other two that hung with him, but not Jesus. 
in John chapter 19, verse 36, it says, These things happened in fulfillment of the scripture that says, Not one of his bones will be broken. Jesus also broke the bread that night so that he could distribute it among his disciples, which represented him sharing his life with them, each of them. As you eat this bread, I want you to remember that Jesus Christ fully emptied himself in order to live among us as a man. He kind of set his deity aside and lived as a man among us. Paul talked about it in Philippians chapter 2. It said, Jesus made himself nothing. Nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and he appeared in human form. And in human form, he obediently humbled himself even further by dying a criminal's death on the cross. That's what Jesus did for us. I want Dave to pray. And pray that we would remember this sacrifice that Jesus made for us, giving his body for us. Let's pray. Jesus said, I live by the power of the living Father who sent me. And in the same way, those who partake of me will live because of me. He said, I am the true bread from heaven. And anyone who eats this bread will live forever and not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna. It's not this piece of bread that gives us life. It is Jesus. This represents his body. Let's give him praise as we partake. Luke goes on to tell us that after the supper, Jesus took another cup and he said, This cup is, my, is the new covenant between God and his people. It is an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The juice is symbolic of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. The blood that Jesus shed that day was like no other blood it was an untainted blood that means it was pure it was clean it was undefiled it was innocent it came from a sinless sacrifice remember Jesus was the perfect lamb of God his blood made it possible for us to be right with God boy that's an awesome thought to be right with God by his blood, we are made righteous. The, those who are unrighteous are made righteous through the blood. The blood that Jesus shed was done so, so that we could be forgiven. By his blood, we become faultless. We become blameless. The book of Jude, these words are written. And now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single spot. I, I tremble when I think of that. First of all, just to stand in the presence of God. But then knowing who I am, to be able to stand in the presence of God, clean with no fault, with no sin on my soul. All glory to him, he writes, who alone is God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, glory and majesty and power and authority belong to him in the beginning, now, and forevermore. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask Dave Kennedy if he will pray. For the juice that we're about to partake of. Would you do that for us? The Apostle Paul wrote, So we praise God for the wonderful kindness that he has poured out on us because we belong to his dearly beloved Son. What kindness! 
He is so rich in kindness that he purchased our freedom, our freedom through the blood of his son, and our sins are forgiven. Wow. To be able to stand before God clean because of the blood that this juice represents, what an awesome day that's going to be. Amen. Let's drink this in remembrance of that. Paul also said, he wrote, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you preach, you tell the good news of the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper is a very, very special celebration time that we get to enjoy as a family of God. What a beautiful day it is. We also get to celebrate unity because of this. This whole Lord's Supper is all designed to bring us together. It is also to celebrate what real joy really is. It's here to remind us of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. We partake of the Lord's Supper to proclaim the love of Christ to a lost and dying world. We also partake of this Lord's Supper to demonstrate to the world that we're not ashamed of Jesus. Amen? We're not ashamed of our Lord. We're not ashamed of his shed blood. We're not ashamed of the fact that we belong to him or that we serve him or that we obey him. What a beautiful thing to be able to obey the Lord. The Lord's Supper for me I think the highlight of all this for me is it's a reminder one day, one day he's coming back. Friends, our Lord is alive and he promised to return and he's coming back soon. May that be our thought. May that be our prayer. May that be our preparation because we want to be ready when he comes, right? Let me pray. Father, Thank you for giving us this special, special event that helps us to stay focused like a compass on the direction we should go. It reminds us of just how much you love us and how important we are to you. Please, O Lord, bless this day for your glory and honor. There's still much to do. Help us to be ready when you come. Help us to hear those words. Thy good and faithful servant, a job well done. Enter in to my rest. We praise you, Lord. You are good to us. You are kind and merciful. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's cover the table. you stand as we worship together and celebrate this time. Redeemer, Redeemer. 
blessed Redeemer,